Hello everybody and welcome back. We have started our Let's Make Games series and we're making an asteroid style video game with uh, that I'm calling Flat Asteroids. In this series we are going to be making complete video games. Uh, so going through all of the steps and everything that we need to do to make a video game. And here's what we left off with. We created our uh, polygon for our spaceship. So today we're going to create the actual entity class and the the entity class is going to be the parent or base class for pretty much everything that exists in the game world. It's going to contain information like what is the position, what is the velocity, what's the orientation or our angle of rotation, what does it look like, what does our object look like, and they're all going to be defined with polygons, so everything is going to be a polygon. Let's get started writing the entity class. So in our Flat Asteroids project we're going to add a new class. I'm going to call this Entity. This is going to be an abstract class. Everything in the world is going to inherit from this class. Here's the constructor. The entity is going to contain quite a bit of information. In fact, most of the information will be contained in the entity, and then the child classes will contain a little bit of very specific things, but most of the information will be inside the entity. So I'm going to make all of these fields protected so the child classes can get that information. The first one is going to be the position, so I'm going to need a vector two for that. Let's bring in the mono game namespace. I'm also going to want to bring in the flat namespace. We also want to define. We also want to define a vector two that will be the velocity. I'm hoping you create kind of a mini physics engine for this. Everything in the world is going to have a position and a velocity and orientation. And they're all going to be kind of floating in space, and we're going to be able to collide and bounce off each other shoot projectiles that will be able to hit other entities and then influence their movement as well. So we're going to have a position, a velocity, we want the orientation. I'm just going to make that an angle, so that'll just define angle are we currently facing. And I also want each entity to have a color. And actually one more thing here at the top, I want each entity to have an array of vertices. And then we're, when we're defining the entity, we're going to go ahead and pass in the array of vertices that will define what it looks like, or a polygon in clockwise winding order that will define sort of the physical characteristics of this entity. So there's our vertices. Uh, let's pass in a position. The velocity will initialize to zero, the angle will initialize to zero, and then we can pass in a color. Most of these things we're just going to pass on through, so the vertices will just set equal to that vertex array we passed in. The velocity is just going to start out always at zero. The angle is going to start out at zero. And finally the color will just pass on through. Alright, and then we have a couple of virtual functions. The first one is going to be an update function. We're going to need to pass in the game time. And we're going to use the game time to help us manage the updates. We want everything to happen on a per second basis. For example, if we're moving something by a certain step, we want it to happen on a per second basis. And then another virtual function will be uh, draw, and we're going to need the shapes, the shape batcher for that. Update is going to be fairly simple, I believe. Let's just go ahead and update the position. For every entity, we'll take the position and we're going to increment by the current velocity. And we're going to multiply that by the amount of seconds that have elapsed since the last update. And let me just show you what that looks like. I call this game, we actually want to call this the game time. Okay, there we go, this will be the game time. We're going to multiply the velocity times the elapsed game time. And if you look at this, this is the time since the last call to update. So the game loop is happening in these discrete steps. And so every time the game loop comes back around and runs update, this elapsed game time tells us this is the amount of time that's elapsed since the last update. If we call that property and then call the total seconds of that property and multiply that by the velocity, that'll indicate that we want this to happen on a per second basis. So we're telling that we want to update this position by this velocity per second. Inside the draw function it's going to be very simple. We're just going to take uh, the shape batcher and we're going to draw a polygon. It's going to take the vertices of the object. It's going to take a transform which we haven't created. The thickness of the lines are just going to be one and we'll pass in the color. Now as far as the transform goes we'll just create the transform here and again 
this flat transform is something that we created inside our flat library. And it basically takes the place of the matrix class and allows us to do transformations in two dimensions really efficiently and really quickly. And so let's just create the new transform it wants a position, angle, and scale. So the position will just be the position of our object. The angle will be the angle of our object. And then the scale, for now, that'll just always be one. And then we'll just pass in that transform here. Okay, so now we can update, we can draw every object. And now we're actually going to create an entity that will, a child entity that will inherit from entity, and that's gonna be the player class. So let's add a new class. I'm not sure what exactly I want to call this. Maybe player or ship, or maybe main ship. Okay, we'll call it main ship. Maybe we'll come up with a really cool name for what the ship is called, but this is the ship that the player is gonna to use to interact with the world in the game. So now we'll just call it main ship. I know it's kind of generic, but uh, maybe we can come up, come up with a better name later on. We'll add that. This is going to inherit from our entity class. We'll create our constructor and then call the base constructor here. We need to bring in the monogame namespace. So that'll be that one. The base class, let's see, that wants the vertices, the position, and the color. Let's just pass those things on through. So here will be the vertices, the position, and the color. Okay, and I don't think we're gonna have to define anything else right there. Later on, when we have specific information for this ship, we'll go ahead and add that in. Actually, looking at this, I don't think we need to implement the draw or update right now. So now that we can create a main ship for the player ship, let's go back to the game class. We're now gonna get, we're going to now just get rid of these uh, class defined vertices and transform up here. And let's make a player, or actually this is going to be the main ship and I'm going to call this the player. These vertices here, we're going to keep the definition of the vertices, but we're going to make this a local variable and then we're going to send it into the player class we just created. Okay, and the transform we can get rid of because we're not using that right now. Let's create the player class. We'll pass in the vertices. We're just going to start at the origin and the color. We'll just make a light green for now. Come up with a better color later. When we're actually drawing now, well, let's get rid of our draw polygon. And we're just gonna tell it we want to draw the player and pass in the shape batcher. So that should take care of that. And so let's go ahead and run it and just see what happens. We should get the player showing up in the middle of the screen. There we go. So we have the player defined showing up in the middle of the screen with the default orientation. Here inside the update function, we need to update the player and pass in the game time. This makes sure that the player is actually moved every update by the velocity that we specified. And now let's go ahead and actually make it so we can interact with the player. So inside our main ship class, I want to have a couple of functions. The first one is going to be a rotate function, and we're going to pass in an amount. And this will just allow us to change the orientation. I want to be able to rotate the ship either left or right by a certain amount, whatever we pass in there. And all we're going to do is increment the angle by the amount that we are passing in. Um, except there is one more thing I want to do. I want to make sure that this angle is between 0 and 360 degrees or between 0 and 2 pi. All right, I don't want to go outside that range. Let's just go ahead and clamp this value. So if the angle is less than 0, then I want to loop back around. So it's basically I'm, I'm looping back in a circle. We're going to then increment the angle so we're then going to increment the angle by 2 pi to ensure that we stay within that, that range. Okay, I don't want this angle to get really large or really small because then you, run, you start running into uh, floating point precision errors. But if we can keep the angle between 0 and 2 pi, we won't, won't run into those problems. And so then we'll do the other side of that. If the angle is greater than or equal to 2 pi, uh, then we're going to take the angle and we're going to subtract 2 pi and that'll just bring it back to the other side. Okay, so there's the rotate function. The other thing is I want to be able to apply a force. So let's go back to the draw program. Okay, so here's the ship we created in the draw program. Uh, what I want to be able to do now is let's say that this is the ship, okay, and it's facing this direction here. When I press the up arrow key, I want the ship to then apply a force in the direction that it's facing. As you press up, it'll start moving in this direction. But then as we get over here, now let's say we've changed the orientation so the ship is facing this direction. And then you press up, now it's gonna apply a force like this 
and we're going to end up with these two velocities being added together, and so you're going to end up a new added velocity that's more like that direction. What that looks like, let's make a function called apply force, and we're just going to pass in an amount of force that we want to supply. Force is going to have a direction and a magnitude. This amount here is going to be the magnitude of the force, but we need to figure out what the direction of the force is. We get the direction from this angle here. To calculate that, we can just take the cosine and the sine of this angle. That'll give us a two-dimensional vector uh, that will tell us the direction. So I'm going to make a vector 2 that is the force direction. And that'll just be the cosine of the angle will give us the x component of the direction. And then the sine of the angle will give us the y component of the direction. And let me put this in there. Now we have the force amount and the force direction. We want to combine those into a force that we're going to apply then to the velocity. Okay, and so what we're actually doing is applying an acceleration to the velocity. Just like back over here where we incremented the position by the velocity. Now in order to get acceleration, we need to increment the velocity by an acceleration force. The velocity would just be incremented by the force direction times the force amount, and that'll give us change to our velocity. Let's go ahead and see if we can implement these functions inside of our game class. So before we call update, we're going to have a couple of keyboard inputs here. We're going to check to see if this key is down. Um, I'm going to use the left arrow key to, to indicate a counterclockwise rotation, and then I'm going to use the right arrow key to indicate a clockwise rotation. So if we're pressing left, we want to go counterclockwise. So I'm going to tell the player that I want to rotate a certain amount. And let's go ahead and figure out what that amount will be up here. Uh, we're going to have a floating point. That'll be the player rotation amount. We want this to be something that happens on a per second basis. How about we rotate half of a complete rotation in one second. If we want to rotate half of a rotation, that would be 180 degrees or pi. So I'm going to tell I want to rotate at pi, but I want to do that every second. So then I have to bring in the game time and the elapsed time and the total seconds. And so now the rotation amount is going to be pi radians every second. And so I can just play place that in here now, the player rotation amount. And then to get the clockwise rotation, it's going to be the rotation amount, but a negative rotation amount. All right, so let's go ahead and run that. And let's just see if we can rotate or change the orientation of the player. I'm pressing the right arrow key now. You can see a, a clockwise rotation. And I press the left arrow key, and you can see a counterclockwise rotation. And so let's start here. It should take about one second to turn all the way around, or 180 degrees. Yep, and that looks exactly right as far as I can tell. Not measuring that precisely, but it looks pretty good. All right, so we have rotation. The next thing we want to do is now apply the force of acceleration. So let's check to see if the keyboard, the up arrow key. So if we press the up arrow key, now I want to apply a force of acceleration in the direction that we're currently facing. So that'll just be the player apply force force we want to bring in, I don't know exactly what that would look like. So let's just put a number in there just to see how much we want to do. And we want to do this on a per second basis. Uh, any kind of movement or changing anything about the player, we want to multiply in this total seconds from the elapsed time. So we're going to do 50 times the game time elapsed in seconds. That should apply a this force in the direction that we're facing. Let's just see how that number feels to us. We'll run this. Okay, so if I press the up arrow key now, it should move straight ahead to the right. I should get acceleration to the right. And there we go, that looks really good. So now I'm going to rotate back this way, and I'm going to press up, and you can see we're slowing down. As I applied force in the other direction, you see the player is now slowing down, and then starting to move back the other direction, and accelerating over there. Okay, let's apply force back this way. Let's see if we can move up now. And you can see it just adds all the forces together. So as I turn around here, it's just going to keep adding those forces in there and moving in the direction. Every update, it adds the new force and accelerates in the new direction, whatever we're facing. So there we are. Uh, maybe just one more thing. I also want 
as the player reaches the end of the screen, or actually as any entity reaches the end of whatever we can see on the screen, or in our game, I want it to wrap back around to the other side. So inside the updates, our entity updates, for every entity, I want that to happen. I want it to just kind of loop back to the other side. We're gonna need access to the camera class in order for that to happen. So let's pass in the camera class. The camera class has a function that we created called get extents, and that'll give us an indication of how far we can see. And so I'm gonna get a vector two that defines the minimum and a vector two that'll define the maximum. Next, I'm gonna call this the uh, camera min and then the camera max. That'll just show us where the edges of the current visible display are. And then we can just determine if the position has gone outside those boundaries. So first, let's check the X position. If the position on the X is less than zero, then we want to increment the position to now loop back to the other side. And so that'll be the X position plus equals some amount. And I just need to get that amount. So let's find out what the camera view width is. That'll just be the cam max X minus the cam min x. Okay, that'll give us the total viewable width. And let's do the same thing for the height. And that'll just come from the y values. So then if we've gone all the way to the left and we're going outside of the viewable area on the left, I then want to wrap back around to the other side. So we're going to increment the x by the total amount of view we have. So that'll be the cam view width. And then we need to do this four times, one for every edge. So let's do the next x value. So if now if the x is greater than or equal to uh, the if the x is greater than the uh, now the max x and actually I did the first one a little bit wrong we, this should not be zero it should be whatever the the minimum x is so let's put the cam min x okay now the next one is the cam max x on the right and if we've gone beyond the the right side maximum we want to subtract or go back to the left by the amount of the width. So now I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to just paste this back in there. Let's change these to the Y values. So now we can do it on the Y components. So this part will stay the same. It's just we're changing X for Y. Instead of the camera width, camera view width, this is going to be the camera view height. And so that should provide the wrapping capability. Let's go ahead and run this and it does not work because we are missing an argument in our update function and that was looking for the camera. So let's just pass in the camera. There we go. Let's run that, see what happens. Okay, so we have our player accelerating up, and it should, when it hits the top, go back down to the bottom. Perfect. That looks good. All right, now let's try the other sides. We'll go over here to the left. Okay, that works. Go back to the right. If I can slow down. <laughs> okay, going back to the right, and now let's go to the bottom and just see if it wraps back to the top. There we are. Perfect. Okay. So that's the entity, the player entity we've created. Next time, uh, we're gonna. Next time, we're gonna work on creating the asteroid entity, and the asteroid entity is gonna be a little interesting because we're actually going to make that uh, very randomly. The shape and the velocity and where it starts on the screen will all be kind of random, and so we'll talk about generating uh, random asteroids next time.